The Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES as it was affectionately called, was Nintendo's first major foray into worldwide video game dominance, first released in Japan as the Famicom, or Family Computer in 1983, and later in 1985 as the Nintendo Entertainment System, some sought to bring NES games to other platforms through emulation. I'm Too Late Nate, and you're watching The Early History of NES Emulation. The history of the first NES emulators is fairly debatable, with some being called hoaxes. As new information comes to light, I hope to update this video's description to reflect that. Our journey begins seven years past the initial release of the Famicom in 1990, with not one, but two emulators independently developed as side projects. One being a little-known program called the Family Computer Emulator, released on the FM Towns by Harahisa Utagawa, who was a long-term programmer for Namco throughout the 1980s and even worked on Sonic Blast in 1997. The other, an emulator by Yuji Naka, former head of Sonic Team, developed on the Sega Genesis or Mega Drive, depending on where you're from. The Family Computer Emulator could only run a handful of titles and with no sound support while Mr. Naka's emulator ran Dr. Mario and was built for amusement. However, because of the speed of the Genesis, it would seem that at least early on, Yuji Naka's project probably didn't run all that smoothly. Not to say that this emulator isn't an amazing achievement in its own right. I mean, commercially running an NES game on a Genesis would be the ultimate slap in the face for Nintendo. I can only wonder why Sega never actively tried pursuing this. It would be essentially Bleem before Bleem was a thing just for Nintendo. Shortly after this, Pacifamicom, or Pacifami as others called it, developed by Nabukai Ando, was released with a date of May 1st, 1993 in its info file. This emulator was developed for the FM Towns as well, and while it did have sound emulation, it was pretty terrible. Pacifami required a licensing fee to use, though it didn't run much in the way of games, and was the very first, if not one of the very first emulators, to include a rather harsh anti-piracy measure later in its life cycle. Because of the heavy pirating of emulators at the time, Passifami decided to include malicious code that would format a user's hard drive if determined illegitimate. Handfuls of users also reported that DRM targeted their machines even when their copies were legitimate. A Windows release came out two years later in 1995, but was quickly overshadowed by both Landiness and Ines, also known as Interness in 1996. A quick announcement, when doing research for this emulator, I discovered that Nabukai Andu had passed away earlier in May of this year, which is very unfortunate. A lot of controversy spread between emulation developers Alex Krabisky, known as Landy, the developer of Landiness, and Marat Fezulin, the original developer of Ines, which is still actively being maintained today. What we know for sure as of today is that Alex Krabisky's code became the foundation of Ines, which originally started as shareware from earlier version. But when version 0.7 hit, Ines required a $35 registration fee, which was quite a lot for an emulator in the 90s. Funnily enough, not only did Alex Kravisky's code become the very foundation for INES, but he also gave Merit his Game Genie code for free shortly before Merit announced that 0.7 and onward would be a paid commercial product. Even still, INES is one of the most feature-complete Nintendo Entertainment System emulators to date, and it has been ported to various devices over the years, along with essentially creating the INES or NES file header, which became the emulation standard and greatly simplified ROM dumping, though the source code for INES isn't readily available without obtaining essentially a paid license. And although Alex stopped development of his own emulator, Landiness, when a later emulator came to fruition, its contributions paved the way for early NES emulation and were felt for years to come. The next stop on this emulation train is NESA, or Nintendo Entertainment System in Assembler, developed by Paul Robson in the UK. The emulator was completely free and up to this point was one of the only Nintendo emulators that had source code available to look at and possibly fork. This emulator was fast. Being 100% assembler code meant a large speedup for running multitude of games, though INES still beat it by a considerable margin for title playability. There was an interesting interview that Paul Robson did a few years back on his experiences in the NES emulation scene in the 1990s. I'll include the link in the description for those curious enough. For a free emulator, NESA did fairly well and was a good alternative, at least until April 3rd, 1997. Nesticle was released to the public as freeware from Bloodlust Software, aka Icer Addis, and it turned NES emulation on its head. You see, 
Nesticle's system requirements were far lower than other emulators at the time, allowing people to run NES games on a 486 compatible processor clocked at a mere 25 MHz with relative ease. Compare that to other emulators that required more expensive hardware, a registration fee that didn't even run most games full speed, and you can see why this emulator was a playground favorite. In later versions, the emulator supported save states, game genie codes, courtesy of Mr. Krabisky from Landiness, sound control, multi-snapshot support, Camerica game support, and later zapper emulation through a mouse pointer. The emulator even supported playthrough recording or an extremely early version of a let's play or gameplay video. One could even edit graphics and in-game palettes for games. Even though this emulator had some game-breaking bugs, it almost seemed like this would be the pinnacle of freeware NES emulation. However, like all things, there was a catch. Nesticle wasn't designed around accuracy, but rather convenience and speed, with a lot of games being hacked and patched to the point where the games weren't really running how they should have been. The last recorded version of Nesticle was X.XX on August 18, 1998 for DOS and was shortly discontinued afterward. The reason being was that the source code was stolen from Icer Edis' computer by Donald Moore, aka Mind Rape of Damaged Cybernetics. Shortly after, Nesticle was discontinued. Nesticle wasn't just an NES emulator, but also a pioneer in graphics editing and sound remixing, being attributed by the magazine Spin as creating the video game music genre as well as redefining the emulation scene, forcing some to innovate and inspiring others to create. As we move towards the turn of the century and the ending of early NES emulators, another massive leap in emulation was about to unfold for a console only three years old. It was so blazingly fast that it would threaten the concrete foundations of one of history's most beloved consoles. Hey! Listen! But that's a story for another time. Hey all, I hope you enjoyed my video. I had a great time making it. If you did like it, please hit that like button and subscribe for more content. Be sure to hit that notification bell as well if you want to be notified of the next video segment. Thank you for watching again, and I wish you guys all a great night.